This is Podkit, episode 57, I Dare You to Type Rack, on March 59th, 2020. And now, Vin Diesel is more furious. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk57. Howdy. Happy, um, what is it today? March, like, 52nd or something? Um, something like I, that. I think is that, that joke up. dead yet? No, it's not. It's not. Um, I believe that joke expires in 2024. Uh, March, uh, 12,000 or something. Yeah, no, maybe. 1,200, 12, not 1,000. Uh, yes, because it, 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 um, overflowed the, uh, signed int. <laughs> dates they're never easy anyway no nope. well we're still here um we're back with another episode uh, a month later like we like to do um yeah we've got a few topics uh starting off let's uh i had the most like ridiculously productive weekend two weeks ago where i knocked off two things that have been, been on my like fun dev to-do list for like a year and a half and the, the first one was playing with Canvas, doing some, like, 2D Canvas stuff. And so uh, Ryan and I live coded with um, VS Code Live Share and a Zoom call for six hours. And we started up. At... It was just amazing. Yeah, it was so much fun. We started at, like, 9.30 p.m. too, so solid Saturday night. But, yeah, we came up with this code pen, uh, or we shared it there. We, we did the live code in some silly node server we we threw together that thing was the most brittle joke server i've ever seen <laughs> we spent the first hour trying to get that web server running uh, but then we did it oh. so it has live reloading and um we got prettier installed and uh you know we're and now we're editing in a single script element in a single html file but we have prettier and a node live server and and live reload yeah live reload yeah yeah well, there you go uh, I think from Browser Sync, something like that. I think so. Or at least at one point, yeah. I don't know. Things changed a lot over the course of that four, six hours. If anyone wants to see what that code is, let me know. Uh, it's not online anywhere, but I, I could if anyone wants to. You you probably don't, dear listener. You, yeah, you you probably don't. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we shared it to CodePen. Uh, there's a link in the show notes, and it's basically some dots and some lines, and. Uh, we, we went through the progression of so I, I had a very small start of I think it was a hundred dots randomly f- generating every frame so it was like sixty frames per second of just black dots moving flashing all over not even moving just like it was you know like static it was like that but made with a hundred black dots on yep. a white background nice so we went from that to I think we have uh something like twenty dots bouncing around with lines connecting them the colors change there's some like transparency stuff yeah so they they move they have directions um ryan was a math whiz at some of this stuff um yeah it was good fun yeah it was a lot of fun um like some of the some of the cool highlights here um is this is uh as brian mentioned canvas based which is all, all you know everybody's favorite thing um on line twenty four, we have we have made a new mathematical constant called tau. It's famous. It's incredible. Everybody should get a tau of their own. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the interesting things that you know, as as uh, React developers and um, sort of uh, functional programmers, al- although there are, there's always more to go in terms of functionalnessism, whatever, um, is we actually used a class. And I never use classes in any code for any reason ever. But this is actually kind of one of those times where it's almost useful to have a class. Oh, it saved us. It We were like, uh, and then Ryan was like, here. Just put it in a class. Class it'll be fine. point, and it just started working. Yeah. <laughs> What was the hangup? The the reason the cl- the the class thing is so cool is conceptually each one of these dots 
the other dots don't care about each one. Like you don't need to pre-compute every dot. You don't need to pre-compute every dot's motion. Just let the dots maintain themselves. And for each frame, let them figure out how much they need to move to, uh, you know, perform their movement. It's really cool. It's, it's a re- really nice method of doing it. Uh, method. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was fun to have different, um, you know, little equations and formulas to do different colors and, and and stuff. It's it's just a lot of fun, and it it turns out uh, turned out really well. Yeah, and then we're doing things like um, you know calculating the distance of two points um, to find you know how how close points are to start drawing a line, and then we're doing different opacity when they're a certain range of distance apart of those lines. Um, it supports high DPI displays, so there's some logic around that. Um, we have them bounce off the the corner or the edges of the of the canvas window. So there's, um, you know, the, the center point of the point is in the center of the dot, but the point has a radius, and then the lines are even the the width of the line is even larger than the circle or the point. So we have some math around edge detection around that point. Um, there are a couple bugs, so you can um, there are there's some resize detection, so you can kind of push points further in if you resize the canvas but you can trap points outside of the canvas and they will stay around and then you can like rapidly expand the canvas back out and you'll see them again and there's a cup there's a bug where they'll hit the edge and they'll just kind of jitter around if they're they're kind of stuck in the edge of the canvas i don't really understand why it's happening but it's and, beautiful uh, I love yeah it. <laughs> and there's there's a tiny bit of randomness in the bounce. when they bounce yep. so it's not like a pure straight line of the the angle but it's that plus a little bit of difference so you can see if one's stuck it just kind of jitters really quickly and bouncing around uh-huh. um and each dot has a slightly random speed to it so um it just it adds a little more fluidity um yeah this is super fun quite a bit of math in the end but as you like progress through you you just slowly add more and more and more um yeah I, I highly recommend to anybody who's doing this kind of thing to just go and read, um, like, go find, like, a, I don't know what that guy's called on YouTube, like, three blue, one brown or something. Uh, like, find some math videos and just go watch, like, what does cosine look like? What does tan look like? What does, what what do multiplying numbers together mean? What does tau, what's tau? Tau is two pi. Oh, right, of course. <laughs> uh... Yeah, it's uh, it's been a long what running the, gig. You yep. you wrote a function, Ryan, that we oh, just the had sig- in the sigmoid, file. Sigmoid function. <laughs> ah, of course. Yes, everybody loves so the we, sigmoid function. We just had a sigmoid function that we are just randomly start calling and say, "What does this do? Does it help? Does it do no, anything for it us?" It didn't help the whole time. <laughs> but it was there. Yeah. yeah, we removed it eventually, but it could have been cool if it worked. It was one of the last things to remove. I think it was when we copied it into the the code pen. It, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that was um, Ryan and I's fun six hours a week and a half ago. Um, I would totally be down to do something like this again. Yes, um, for sure. It's just it's a fun social way to to learn something new and create something ridiculous. And maybe we won't have to waste five hours. I mean, four hours of uh, of that time setting up the live reload. <laughs> We'll just copy the same bad script. Yeah, just, you know, is just, this how libraries are formed? You well, just hobble together something stupid, and then if you eventually just keep adding more to it and stabilizing it, and then all of a sudden, you've created... Uh, Remix.run. Oh, wait, no. We're talking about that later. <laughs> Coming um, soon. I was, I was going to say, isn't that like... Um, who's who's the Express.js guy? Um, who may or may not be a real person, like William Shakespeare? TJ? TJ's Law. No. No, you're going to have to expand on that. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. I'm... I, did, I will say, I thought you were going to say William Shatner, not Shakespeare. Yeah. That, William that Shatner. Anything. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you, could just, you could just marker that one right out then. No, we're keeping that. That's great. Oh, uh, man. But yeah, um, well, like, Express was built way in the early days of Node. And it shows. Yeah. some Its API is just weird and... Um, Awful. It's very callback driven. And I dare I, you uh, to try to type wreck. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, my all 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 I meant by that was every library starts by just something somebody needs, and eventually you find out you built this great and terrible thing. Yeah, and then you have to support it for twelve years or something, and till the end of time. And like half of the API servers is now built into Node itself. Anyway, that was our CodePen journey. There you go. And hey, you'll be able to share it at the CodePen meetup next time. Yeah, so this was the night before the CodePen meetup. And so we were like code until a little after 3.30 maybe. Uh, this CodePen meetup was at 11. And you want to guess what time I woke up? Noon. 12. It was uh, 11.30. I don't know. I, it was definitely like past the start and too far past the start for me to just join in late. And um, yeah, I was I was super unhappy with myself. But it's fitting that... Um, I slept through it because we were working on a code pen for the code pen meetup. Anyway. So if anyone's listening who goes to that, I'm sorry. Next time I'll try to do better. Next time. Hey, you know, we might even um, add more stuff to it by the time next time comes around. Yeah. You never know. You know yeah. We could keep working in it or yeah. Make, fork it and keep going. Yeah. Make a new one. No. Yeah. So, um, on this uh, weekend that I did a bunch of stuff. So that was Saturday. Then Sunday, I was just like, well, I'm not doing this CodePen meetup. What else can I do? And so I'm like, hmm, Svelte's been on my list of things to check out for a little while. So then I spent many hours on Sunday um, taking uh, – so on my website, brightm.me, I have a little table that loads from Last.fm that – shows the top 10 artists that I have listened to and it links the artist and the play count of songs by that artist um, for the last month. So uh, my first version uses Fetch. Well, they all use Fetch. Um, it, it grabs it and then I use just vanilla JavaScript to um, create a table and load it up row by row and do some formatting in the cells. But it's you know such a tiny component, and it seems like something that Svelte is really good to use with, um, like a t- you know little helper widgets and things like that. So this is kind of fit the book perfectly in my eyes. So um, I uh, created a Svelte component. It's a single component. It's using the async await or the like promise template things. I don't know any of the terms in Svelte, but um, trust me, nobody does. <laughs> But yeah, so I have like this this promise in the script for the component that is just the fetch function around the the endpoint, and so I can in the like markup for this component, um, I basically say await the promise, and then uh, in that block is the loading indicator, and then the next one is when it uh, resolves, then I have the whole table markup. You know, it's iterating over the objects in the response array, and then. You know, it's using map and, um, or no, it's not using map. It's using like a f- for each loop kind of thing. Um, and then there's an error state where I show a little error message. And so it's um, it's really interesting having those primitives built into the, the library. I don't know. Yeah. So it's just interesting to use something that's not React. It was fun. And then I, I got Rollup working with Jekyll and they both live reload. And so it makes developing easy. Um, I now like... Cache bust my JavaScript and CSS in the site. Yeah, and then I ran, since I had Rollup set up, I ran my dark theme configure thing through Rollup as well and dramatically reduced the complexity of that just because I was in it again. Anyway, yeah, so Svelte. Nice. Pretty cool. I think there's a lot more you can do with Svelte that I clearly am not doing, but I think any little like functionality on my site, I'll be less afraid to add any JavaScript to it and just start adding little Svelte components. Anytime I look at this code, it's just like, how does it work? Why does it work? I don't know what it does. It looks very similar to Vue, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, it does. In the sense that you have like a script and you have markup and you can have a style and then, you know, render, it'll pluck out the styles and scope it. Yeah, and I'm kind of, kind of, kind of over Vue. So I guess I, I'm, I'm fully, 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 totally committed to the jsx lifestyle at this point but like you a tiny thing on a static site i don't know it seems ridiculous to ship more like and this alone this is 
the the compiled output is three times larger with this using Svelte than what I had before. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't have used regular JavaScript. Yeah, well, and that's what I had before this Svelte component. Yeah, but um, this is this is a little easier to to look at too. Debatable. Uh, the other thing is uh, you <laughs> could uh, use Gatsby. That means I would have to uh, stop using Jekyll. At this point, Jekyll is so old school; it's it's new school. It's, and um, it's there something. are new there are new static site generators like Eleventy that are built around porting from Jekyll to a new generator. So I would probably switch to that over something like this. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. What I like about Jekyll is that GitHub builds it, and then I don't have to ship any like compiled stuff in the repo other than the minified JavaScript, but I could throw it in a, like a, you know, another branch and a GitHub pages branch and just yeah use a workflow. And I uh, could, yeah. Yes. Our friends at Vercel. A circle CI, a Travis CI, a uh, webhook to my own server. I don't know. Yeah. Any, any of those things. So yeah, that's, um, that's what I got done a week and a half ago when I was doing a bunch of, fun things on my own. So there's a link to uh, Svelte and my Svelte component in the show notes. So you can check that out. Nice. Super cool. I'm kind of interested in Svelte as well. I haven't messed around with it um, yet, which is kind of interesting because I usually am pretty keen to to try some of that stuff out, but just haven't had a good example of what to do, uh, what to do with it yet. But that seems pretty, pretty snazzy. There's like one other interaction on my site that I feel like, I could use this felt component here. And that's on my, if I write a blog post, there's a comment section that um, is through Discus. And right now I have a button that says load comments. And there's a click handler on there that adds a bit of, it's uh, basically just like a string that it just appends to the DOM that is the Discus comment thing, including a script tag and stuff. But it's just like a one way, just write it to the DOM and then be done. It's like so simple that I don't think it warrants a Svelte component. Probably not yet. Yeah, and I, unless I want to like f- uh, build some logic to remove Discus from the global context and the DOM, but that seems kind of ridiculous too. I don't think that's useful. And then Discus already has all your browser info anyway, so. Yeah, I um, I don't have comment sections on my blog. I should really get rid of them. I'd recommend it. Yet. You know... That's there. There's my next weekend's work. Ooh. All five minutes it's going to take me. Perfect. What, whatever happened to web mentions? Do people still use web mentions? I am pretty sure they do not. What is a web mention? <laughs> I've never even heard of that. Tell me more. Uh, I've seen it. Where did I see it? It was, um, what's that thing called? W3 school or what G or whatever it's called. It's like, um, it's like one of those things. It's one of those specs that they made and then forgot to um, implement worldwide. Oh, this was published in 2017? Wow. That's like pretty new, kind of. Yeah. And it will never gain any more traction than that. Doesn't need it. It's fine. It's done. Uh, It's kind of like a backlink for like the old days. Yeah, backlinks. That's kind of what I was thinking of. But it doesn't much matter now. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brandon. You know, there's a thing uh, that you could use if you wanted to instead of GitHub pages that could deploy your uh, 11D site. And I, I I use it quite a lot. And it's called it's called Next. Or Sorry, it's not called Next. It's called Now. But you know what? Now it's not called Now. Now it's called something else. Now, now and then. then yeah. What, so what is... So if it's... If then it was called Now, now... Uh, uh, What's it called now? It's not yeah. called now. Now it's called something else. It's called uh, Vercel. They 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 changed the name of the company. Wait, wait, wait! If it's called Vercel, who's one of the sponsor funding companies? Uh, I don't. I, I have no idea. It's Excel. Oh oh oh! Gotcha. Right. So yeah, basically the Zite folks got a bunch of funding, and now they have a different name and the same logo and mostly the same services. So that's cool. Yeah, so their their kind of spin on it was that this is a name change for their their um increased focus on 
front end developer experience. Yeah. All right. That oh. that seems legit. So it's kind of weird. Uh, so long, long ago, uh, Zite, and then Zite now, and then whatever whatever they thought it was back then. It, you would just upload a Docker image, and it would go and inflate the server, and everybody would be happy, and you could do whatever you wanted because it was all Docker based. Yep. But then. Uh, V2 came around, and then they said, no more Docker, get that out of here. And now you can only use some, like, pre predetermined runtime solutions. So you want to run Node? Okay. If you want to run Rust, uh, Rust okay. You want to run Go? No Go. Ha <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe they have Go support now, I don't know. But um, now they have sort of their third version, V3, which didn't actually change DAO in any meaningful way yet, but it's um, increased focus on front-end stuff. So, you know, you can deploy a React website, CRA style, um, with one command, and it's really cool. Yeah. So is this what people use for hosting uh, when you're not me and only uses GitHub pages? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's either this or Netlify. (laughs) Okay, yeah. But that's the thing that I find so interesting because I don't think Netlify is actually an acceptable substitute because Netlify can't run a can't run like Netlify is just static hosting, right? They don't do they won't run like your 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 Next.js SSR side, right? Well, so that's an interesting point. So Vercel, I mean Zite, I mean Next, I mean now, I mean huh? Oh, they made Next. That's what I mean. Right. Right, right, so, right. so Next.js, not to be confused with Nest.js, uh, it is an SSR-based, um, you know, uh, backend and frontend hybrid framework. So, code runs on the backend, code runs on the frontend, and where it runs anytime between, you don't get to know. So, so they they push. It looks like a lot of their templates are, it like Docosaurus, and there's you know Ember, Preact, Vue. Uh, Scully, Iconic, Angular, Polymer, Svelte, Create React App, all that kind of stuff, like Nuxt, Next, uh, Jekyll, Brunch, Eleven, you know, tons of static site generators. And then, you know, like Gatsby and Next. So I think most of these are static or some server-side rendered. So that's kind of, the, they're pushing the, like, you're going to deploy a static website that maybe actually is server-rendered a little bit. But yeah, especially if they're creating Next.js, which is conveniently the first item in their list of templates. Uh-huh. Um, you know, they're, they're at that point kind of pushing for implementing their own product as well. Well, and I think it's, I think it's an interesting point because, uh, you know, the Jamstack stuff is so popular these days to what, for what reason nobody will ever know, but allegedly popular, they tell us. I think every time you see the word Jamstack somewhere, that it's a dollar of VC funding, pretty sure. <laughs> Right, right, absolutely. And that's why that term has always kind of irked me a little bit, right? Because, like, I don't know. I I build things along that pattern, but that pattern doesn't actually seem to fit how those sites are built. It seems to fit something else, and it's always been kind of unnerving what it was. That's what I've always really liked now as a product, and I've often used it not really with any front-end stuff whatsoever. In fact, uh, Brian, the the Meetup API proxy yep. uh runs on site now or you will have used to question mark now do you um, mean now or do you mean next because there's two different I, yes it's not running it's not running it's not a next js app running on now it's okay, literally just, just a, a json endpoint yeah it used it's, it's micro a, it's a tiny serverless function right yep exactly yep, yep, yep. yeah and so I, that's that's the thing like because netlify has functions but that's a different that's a different thing entirely is it actually a different thing? Like, so is now and the Netlify functions affect really that different? I guess I've never used Netlify functions. Yeah, I've never, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> so I've, cl- I've used Cloudflare Workers, which is basically a serverless function. Um, I added uh, some sort of, uh, what did I do? I added a 30 minute cache control header to the response to the client for my little endpoint. And then I added a five minute, or no, sixty second. I don't know some some amount of seconds cache in the Cloudflare network of the actual last FM call. I don't know how it works, but it mm-hmm. seems seems to work. Yeah, those that's a great use case for one of these things. 
Um, I have also recently been thinking about moving um, some of my sites over to um, Zite, and I guess they changed their name, so I'm going to have to figure out how to say Vercel better. Um, one of the reasons I want to move even my own personal RyanRamperset.com site is because if I need to upgrade my server because it happens to be April of 2020, and that means a new Ubuntu is out, right? Um, it'd be nice to host the thing somewhere while I'm doing that move. And for the most part, like I get global CDN, I get cert automation, I get all the stuff that I'd want. And I, allegedly, you can put a domain on it. And allegedly, with the new Vercel, it's free ish, I guess, for what right. I would do with it. That could be enough for me. That's the thing about these um, services that I've, I'm always like, eh, I don't know, because GitHub Pages yep. has and likely will always be free there's never really been any issue about that you know there's a, there's a certain point where your traffic might be high enough where you'll get an email from github and they'll tell you stop it but like that's never going to happen for a personal site right. you have to post something crazy commercial there to do that but um yeah it seems i don't know so those all these new things i just feel like i'll add all this complexity oh absolutely for it to all come crashing down. Yes, exactly. Because I've had the code base for my site has been uh, around and live for at least six years running now. So yeah. it's like I've reworked it a lot, but it's fundamentally the same still. And that's nice. In many ways, it is sort of a waste for me to host. Like, I don't mind paying for stuff, but it is a waste for me to host a static website on my um, four core, four gigabyte RAM uh, VPS. Right. Oh, that's how. Oh, my, yeah. See that. That seems a little ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Is that the only thing running on that server? No, no, no. A lot of a lot of stuff runs on that, but that okay. that's one of the many tenants. I mean, you could be like me and spend five bucks a month for running two Twitter bots that no one cares about, and a Hue bot for our Nexus Slack that is nobody uses, n- nearly worthless. Yeah. Now, I also have another VPS that I pay for, and I'm pretty sure its cert is expired. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Um, you, know, you know, speaking of things like Next, uh, let's talk about another thing that's kind of like that. And it's oh, yeah? called Remix.run. Huh. Uh, and this is from your good friends, Ryan F. and M. Jackson. Ryan Florence, Michael Jackson of the React Training who uh, have built the history package, the React Router, Reach UI. And who've done workshops everywhere across the world. Um, so so Remix.run is supposed to be this revolutionary concept of a, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an F word. I'm pretty sure it's not library. It's not package. Um, do you know the word I'm looking for? Is it framework? Framework. Framework. Yes. <laughs> that's what it is. I, I see, you know, I, I've been trained to believe that frameworks and JavaScript are evil because when you get that, you get Angular. Um, and there's no reason to be obtuse about this. Remix.run could be a bit cute. Um, that was, that was, those were Angle jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I see you did there. So so you get a bunch of stuff. So you get file system routes, which is supposed to be like nests. Not nest, next, nest, next routing, um, route nesting, um, automatic code splitting allegedly. So somehow it knows that different pages are different. I guess um, you get helmet integrated with data driven meta tags, built in data loading. So something like um, suspense and SWR built in location based suspense cache. So it knows where you are and where you've been. Uh, streaming server rendering, so I don't know what that actually means. Um, a ready-to-go config, so you can just, you know, remix run and remix run build, and it'll just go. Um, I don't, I don't know what React refresh is. That could be something. Um, you can deploy anywhere, but I'm sure for an extra two dollars and thirty-four cents a month. You can um, run your remix.run on remix.run.live and use their global CDN <laughs> like everybody else. It'll run on the unpackaged CDN. Right. So what do you guys think about this? Like a framework for writing a React app. Like um, uh, an even framework or framework than Next. Uh, from the like 
taking a step back, someone finally coming up with a solution like, here's how you're going to write React apps. This is the way to do it. You do it like this. Cool. That that seems good. The React community has, I think, notoriously for a long time been a it built up around, yeah, you could do it this way. You could do it that way. Here are a bunch of libraries you can use. I think there's been a lot more convergence lately. But also as things have gone more towards, you know, doing some server rendering. I mean, there's still a bunch of different ways of doing C- dealing with CSS and React has kind of been a long running thing. But um, this really capitalizes around the router and very much route dr- driven stuff. Um, I remember I saw a tweet, I think either Ryan or Michael tweeted about um, like, if you have data on the page, it's not going to reload the page unless you do command R and reload the browser page because that's how websites work. You know, that's the the classic way. You go to a, like a New York Times article and they do an update. You have to do a hard reload of the page to see that update. So they, they have some of these like traditional uh, routing ideologies in with this and but then brings a lot of like um, some server, some client rendering. Um, it splits it all out. So it kind of takes your your nice, fancy, modern single page app and flattens it out to a bunch of isolated bits and makes it all work together. And that seems like a nice way to do it. And I think this would be fun to try out. Yeah, I think it'll be really cool to try. I I don't like, I think there's a lot to still be explored here. Like, so what is the data story? Like, do you have to call another API or is there a database layer? Is there a, what is it? Um, there's still a lot to know. Um, what do you think, Brandon? I think for my part, I, you know, at the, at the risk of sounding a little bit like a next acolyte, um, I don't really see how this is going to be different from any, any of the other things. Right. Um, I don't see a ton here other than specific references to suspense that I can't get with next also out of the box. Um, But I agree that if it's more opinionated than next, that's probably going to be a net positive for some folks. I think like all frameworks, my big hang up is that oftentimes they're going to make decisions that are probably going to be subtly or wildly different from what I would make if I were setting up my own react app. And like anything, I'm going to need time to evaluate whether it's whether the trade-offs of using something like this are are worth the I don't I don't want to say hassle, but I'm going to stick with hassle. Worth the hassle of kind of giving into um, some maybe less than ideal um, setups for the sake of uh, for the sake of sticking with something that's simple and is frankly less lines of code, fewer lines of code. Um, I also heard that this is going to be paid. I heard um, that too. Which I think, you know, there's absolutely, um, you know, with good reason. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's going to be really tricky, though, is like you're, they're going to have a lot of free competitors, right? Um, like Gatsby isn't going away. Create React App isn't going away. And, and then Next there's going away. There's Blitz, which is also coming out, which will be open sourced and presumably free as well. Right. I think they have an alpha now. They they have code and some working examples now. Oh. It's definitely so I, early days, but yeah. So having a paid um, experience for a uh, development vertical, um, I have actually witnessed this a couple of times um, in the Laravel PHP community. Laravel oh, itself yes. is free, and you can kind of think of Laravel being kind of this rough equivalent to Ruby on Rails. Um, and then likewise for JavaScript, you can kind of think of it almost as being sort of like react like it's this thing at the center of the ui ecosystem but you know in php it's like the center of the make app ecosystem so this thing is itself free but then a bunch of stuff around it is suddenly not free so then you've got things like um i don't actually know any of the things that aren't free in laravel anymore um (laughs) one of their things is kind of like this admin panel um tool that you can use it's super cool but the problem is it's not free, so who can use it? Oh, that's called Nova. Um, agencies, agencies can use it, and agencies love it. I'm oh sure, my god, I'm my sure friend, they do. my friend, uh, one of my friends who's another uh, independent developer was telling me how much he really enjoyed Nova, and I was very close to checking it out, but I've never, uh, 
it's it's never seemed like a good time for me to work on something like that. But it's it's a it's a really cool interface. I've seen some demos about it. But continue. And so like in in the um in the Laravel ecosystem, there are a bunch of free things and a bunch of paid things. And my fear is with with Remix to run and associated friends thinking like, hey, I'll do the same thing. I'll make a a software that is useful in quotes, but that is paid, it won't gain the attention and mindshare and, and usage to actually drive anybody forward. Um, and there's always been this sort of, um, you know, push pull with that kind of model where if you make something expensive and paid any amount, doesn't matter. It's really hard to use. On the other hand, you look at something like tailwind tailwind itself is free. You can go and use it. Nobody cares. But Tailwind UI, all of these pre-baked um, components and patterns, yeah, it's 250 bucks. Buy it once and good to go. But that's like per usage. So like in theory, like per website you make with it would have to have its own license. Um, I don't know. I guess it just remains to be seen. Like how do they charge for Remix? Um, and for example, if I'm working at a, in an enterprise company who doesn't spend money, ironically, will spend, um, you know, fifty thousand dollars a year on a database license but not twenty dollars a month on a on a thing otherwise right it doesn't it doesn't cost enough it doesn't cost enough but also it's like like i can't as a developer like they'll ar- reverse argue well go use the free one it's free and it's like well okay yeah you're right <laughs> right but at the same time if it's a really good product and it saves you so much time in implementing it might be worth looking at the paid one and i think from their point of view too it doesn't need to be wildly successful like and have tons and tons of installs for it to be successful to them. It needs to be enough to justify their their time to work on it. You know, if they if they land a few hundred installations of it, it might just pay for itself and they're then it's it's good for their time being and they've maybe pushed and tried out some things and then they can they can talk about approaches they make and that can pull the community for it. But I, I I agree with you too, Ryan. I'm just I think counterpointing. It's a it's a hard thing to do because when you when you uh, when you only have when you when you're in the whole of the open source community and then you you make this free thing, if uh, if enough people don't come by forever, like new people have to come into your into your tool usage space over time, otherwise it dies. Um, if if uh, you know ten thousand people sign up to Remix this year and the next year only you know a hundred people sign up while it's dead uh, but if it's open 500 people will sign up every year yeah well that that's the thing about open source is it's it's always you know it's often not worth it to the to the creator and the maintainers from like a time and financial investment point of view but the whole net community is better because of it because there's this new thing out there and then people can use it's 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 like um i don't know open source is that constant battle of of you know finding companies to to pay and keep open source going to through open collective or some other stuff but that often doesn't happen and so that's why i think there's something like a paid thing like remix.run so i guess we'll see well um yeah. I, I i don't think um it's, it hasn't come out yet it um Still just a sign-up page as far as this episode is concerned. Um, so maybe by the time you're listening to this um, six months from now, in um, what what year uh, does the apocalypse end, Brian? 1200? Um, March March 12th, 12th, 12th. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in March um, 12th, 100th, and 2nd, um, Remix might be available for public review, and maybe it'll be super cool by then. We'll see. I'm curious if they'll have any preview out there. I know they're talking about hosting on their own registry and using API token or something. For that is spooky stuff, that, man. But... We'll see. Yeah, I think my the big biggest thing I'm waiting to see is like how it differentiates itself because differentiating itself by saying we're the folks who made React Router isn't truly doesn't doesn't really differentiate to me. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there are lots of people for whom for whom that would and. Um, uh, and I think at the core of it, they seem like really strong technical communicators. So if there's anybody well positioned to make a go at this, I think it's probably them. So 
should be interesting to see. Yeah, and like this, this brings this puts together a bunch of building blocks that are available for everyone. So from that point of view, it's it's like the, you know, it's taking all these open source things and just combining them together into a well thought out, well developed product. Because I mean, like I I look at what's in the box and I'm like, okay, I could probably figure out a lot of this, but it's gonna take me so much time to do. Why don't we use something like Remix? I don't know. At the same time, what I've been wondering lately is all of the like Next.js and Gatsby and I guess Remix or Blitz, uh, a lot of these frameworks that do partial server rendering and stuff. I don't know. At, at least me in like a larger company, I'm like th- that'll never be a thing in that company. It takes such a difference in approach to justify changing the tech stack and that kind of stuff. Is this like? Stuff targeted at entirely greenfield smaller companies. Yeah, it is to me. It is entirely greenfield. But on the other hand, the other question I have for that whole thing is this: this same community will talk about performance and stuff. But I got to tell you, if you're in a in a Fortune 500 company, logging into your computer in the morning will take longer than the performance gains by code splitting for your entire user base forever. Right. Um, one image that's um, not um, optimized completely as a JPEG will blow all code splitting out of the water. It'll blow all bundle caching out of the water. Doesn't matter. Parse time is, is crazy, though. I've seen apps that are shipping a single 10 megabyte chunk that through some dependency management stuff and a little bit of code splitting, you get it down to like two or three chunks that are all less than 200K. It's like so much maybe not 200k but so much smaller and then the app is actually quite noticeably faster especially when your auth redirects do full redirect on your application yeah well that is bad so yeah i i I think it's for for mostly greenfield and and non as far as i can tell today non uh enterprise deployments uh it is funny you bring that up though because a certain very large bloomington based blue company um does effectively entire ssr on their back end right so like their back end is not um you know not next it's not not obviously not remix it's not it's something they made in house with react nice um like it's not a name brand thing so it's it's interesting because they are an enterprise who actually needs that because it's not an app it's a website right we did that on a project too, and then and then turned it off for various reasons. But uh, it it's you're right. It's very it's very interesting because folks, a lot of folks who have figured that out have already figured it out. But there are new companies and new products every day spinning up that don't have that figured out. So it'll be it'll be something else to see. And I think you know it's the industry you're in as well. A lot of internal tools and and stuff is it's less important to have this kind of performance and stuff. And, you know, like uh, routing patterns that your users expect and understand um, than companies that are, you know, e-commerce, big stores where time is everything and you delay loading your site by half a second and you lose, you know, millions and millions of dollars of potential sales and things. So I think that's where some of where I'm coming from is it's just a disconnect from what the people I follow and the standards I hear about versus the industry that I'm in. And the the needs that that brings. Uh, you know what? It might just be time for everyone's favorite segment. Uh, new Twitter followies. Yeah. Um, I'll start. I've got nothing. <laughs> I've been trying to stay off of Twitter, but it's not really working. Um, so you still get my same old high quality and advisable tweets. Um, but I've got no new followies. How about you, Brian? You know, I've been quarantining. Uh, I, uh, I went on uh, several weeks ago and unfollowed a few people. I'm down to under 500 again, so that's good. I was creeping up there. I was at like five, 505 maybe. I'm 489 as we speak. Um, yeah, I didn't follow many people, just like a musician here and there, some local people in the Twin Cities. But yeah, I'm uh, nothing new much this month. It's you know It's been a quiet month for many different things, including people I follow on Twitter. What about you, Ryan? Nothing as usual? No, actually, I did follow some people, I think I did, at least. Whoa. Um, yeah, just a few. Um, 
I've noticed recently over the past couple of weeks that in my timeline, I'm starting to see people I don't recognize. And so I think people I used to follow have started tweeting again because they're working from home and have more time now. Uh, oh, and it's been yeah, an yeah. interesting thing to like, I have no idea who you are. Who are you in my feed just every day? Um, but yeah, I did follow some new people. Um, one of the things we talked about last time we were here was a new thing called Glaze. It's one of those um, CSS and JS things. Christoph Poduzolo, maybe, could be his name, is somebody I followed. And he made Glaze. And um, it's really cool. Really, really cool stuff. Really interesting tweets um, about the work that he's doing on Glaze. Really, really fascinating. And then we've got uh, David Adair and just another software engineer. And I think he has tweets that are interesting. Tweets. Tweets and emails. Uh, and then finally, I have Sam Slotsky. Um, hey, it's Sam. And, and and I believe somebody on this channel told me about this person uh, on one episode or something, and I had no idea who it was. And apparently, they're a local engineer, so I thought I should follow them. Yeah, Sam's super cool. Um, I think at some point we used to work in the same building. We didn't know each other at that point, but um, a friend of mine used to work with him, and uh, a couple of friends of mine used to work with him, and all spoke super highly of him. So I followed him on Twitter one day, and the rest is history. Just a super cool. Um, super chill Minnesotan who recently started working for Gatsby. So nice. Uh, nice. There you go. There See, more I knew it was something I hear from Minnesota who are working for these big companies, or uh, maybe not big companies, but notable tech companies. Yeah. Who else are you thinking? I don't know. Just like uh, Joe Carlson working for uh, MongoDB. Um, Okay, I'm on the spot. I don't know, but I just feel like there are a couple more. <laughs> it's a hey, feeling. Let's be clear. I get it. I totally get it. MongoDB wasn't web scale until Joe Carlson joined. I just I just want everybody to know that. There's an, an official MongoDB TikTok now. I bet I have yeah. to imagine he's involved with that. I bet he I asked, is. I asked him about it. I asked him about it. It is it is his thing. Of course. It's it's legit. That's incredible. I follow him on TikTok, but I don't think I follow MongoDB. I, I don't have a TikTok. I'm still terrified. I a friend of mine um, who back when we used to be able to go into offices, right? Um, <laughs> who used to work across from us. So March first. Yeah, you know, like a month ago, two months ago. Um, I, she used to come in and chat with Randall and I occasionally. It was really funny because she used to make fun of me for being too old for TikTok, which is hilarious because I'm not. I'm not. I'm not that old. I'm pretty sure you're the youngest <laughs> of all of us here. Yeah, it's mostly it's more relevant to you than me, but somehow I'm on it and you're not. I'm 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 90 years old. I, I still haven't figured out what to post. I've had my account for almost a year and a half, or no, maybe I don't know. So I follow this guy on Twitter who I went to college with, who is like a, a communications and media kind of major, and he did his like senior thesis thing on Vine. And, like, the social media stuff around it. So he's always, like, talking and comparing things to Vine because he's interested in that. So he was talking about Musical.ly when it was Musical.ly before Vine or before TikTok or the other, the other holding company acquired Musical.ly and rebranded it as TikTok. So my account is actually, like, two or three years old or four. It's, like, an ancient account, but um, it's, like, continued on to this day somehow. But I haven't really – I had – I think I – Installed TikTok like a year and a half ago, but I still haven't posted anything yet. I haven't figured out what to do yet. My sister has me beat there. Right on. Well, that just about wraps our new Twitter followees. Uh, where? Uh, oh, what are you going to be doing between now and the next pod kit on March seventy uh, eighth? Um, probably about the same. Just staying home and not going anywhere for any reason at all. Uh, I'm checking my calendar here. What am I going to be doing? I will have finished watching Westworld season three. Oh yeah. Um, maybe I will have finished watching the Fast and the Furious series. I'm I'm trying to finish that now. I watched five and six the last couple nights. So w who's fast and who's furious, or are they all both? Ooh, that's a good question. Is um, is Vin Diesel fast and the other guy furious? So or... they're they're both very fast. I would say Vin Diesel is more furious than um. Uh oh my God! What's his name? The actor, the one who died in 2013. Not Paul Jason Ryan. Statham. Paul Walker. 
<laughs> no, not Paul Ryan. Paul Walker. Paul Ryan. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because Paul Walker is kind of the amalgam of two Republican governors, right? Scott Walker of Massachusetts and Paul Ryan of uh, right. Okay, you see Wisconsin. where we're coming from. Yeah, 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 yeah. that was amazing. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so watching some media. Um, gosh, yeah. I don't know. What am I going to be doing? Um, who knows? Maybe doing some more development for fun on the side. What about you, Brandon? Uh, well, first off, I'm uh, drafting some inadvisable tweets about how Paul Walker, uh, <laughs> when he died, split into Scott Walker and, and Paul Ryan. Um, <laughs> yeah. I can't no, wait to, no, you must post those like now. Those. Uh, that's okay. They'll just go in screen hole. They'll go in screen hole where it belongs. Mm. Don't you have an extra Twitter account for those? I do, but I never post anything there. So well, now you have content. One. There we go. Every once in a while. Um, but no, aside from that, um, I fixed up the espresso machine. So I got an espresso machine probably three years ago. Uh, really, really cheap refurb one. Um, but it actually has held up pretty darn well. And I've been making solid espresso at home. So I'm going to try to keep doing that because it's nice to stay indoors. Lots of cooking, hopefully. Um, yeah. Lots of work. I've been working... Um, like week over week i've been working basically 1.2 um you know 1.2 times the previous week for the past month um so i think i'm up to like 1.6 times my usual i think that's exponential capacity. growth no it's not quite would have to it would have to be exponential would be well no it is exponential it, you're right it's definitionally exponential it's just um it's not doubling. It's not doubling. It's uh, it's it's slow. It was than exponential that. and then and then stopped expanding. Yeah, it's um, it's an S curve. What's that? Logarithmic. Logistic. Logistic. There we go. Yeah, there we go. We got uh, there. Brandon, you you mentioned coffee, and um, so I've been messaging you a lot lately, and I bought an AeroPress. I bought another thing. I forget the name of that hasn't yeah, arrived. The Bee yet. House. The Bee House dripper. The will be here in a yeah. couple of days. You said. Uh, I think so. Yeah. In the next, in the, within the next week, I think. Um, and yeah, I've spent, so the most money I've spent in the last like quarantine time has been on food. So, you know, that's, that's good. And then the next, the next thing has been coffee related things. I've gotten beans from Misfit several times, um, bought new coffee things on a uh, recommendation of Brandon and it's been all very good. And I need to try some cold press soon. Oh with yeah. My yeah. Press, so, um, there's a Marco Arment recipe for uh, cold brew concentrate in an AeroPress that is quite good. I've made oh, it yeah. only a couple times before, but I'd recommend it. He posts it, coffee things a lot, and I I have ignored them until maybe now. And part of the recipe is to um, rewrite the recipe, but in all caps. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Well, he has his own coffee bean roaster. It's he's he's next level. But yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm trying to stay away from that. Um, for the most part, like a, a thing espresso has taught me is that I can make something that's good enough, um, pretty easily, but it doesn't quite replace like it, when you go to dogwood and you get a really good, like cortado or a really good latte, like there's nothing you can't, you can't replace that. And I've only made maybe like one or two things that have even measured up to that. Um, and it takes a long time. You have to let this machine sit for a while. And roasting is kind of like that too, is it's like, all right, eight, nine times out of 10, I'm going to like massively fail at roasting and it's going to be really bad. Um, to, so I'm, to try, me, I'm that's trying to what, keep my brain there. That's what a larger establishment should be doing. I don't want to do that. It takes up too much time and work and. Yeah. And then you're disappointed with the result and yeah, <laughs> but no, it's good stuff. I've also basically aside from food i just bought a bunch of um espresso machine maintenance supplies and some new um glasses to brew espresso into and stuff like that so yeah it's pretty silly pretty silly well anyhow where can we find you guys on the internet brian you can find me on my website brianm.me where i just cross posted an article about using rack testing library from my works engineering blog I also am on Twitter at Brian Mitch L, which is probably the best place to find me. Uh, I try to tweet more about tech things, and it usually just comes out as CSS stuff. But you know, that's what I—that's what I care about, I guess. Apparently, so yeah. 
that's probably where you can find me. Maybe uh, Instagram. I'm also Brian M. Or wow, no, I'm not Brian M. There, I am Brian Mitch L. On Instagram as well. If you go to my site brianm.me, you can find a link to all my social media. Um, it's probably share oversharing, but you know, I got to put it somewhere. It's almost a reference for me more so than for you. But yeah, that's me. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Hi, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter, Ryan Amar, and of course, on my website, ryanramperset.com. It's where all the things are, but less than Brian. I don't have that many things. Brandon? For my part, you can find me uh, a lot fewer places than usual, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, and my website, Brandon.MN, which maybe by the time this is published, might have a blog. Who knows? We'll find out. I feel like we've been hearing that for the last five years of this show. You know, for a for a couple of those years, I did have a blog at that at that address, but then I was like, I don't really want to run this anymore. So we'll see, we'll see. But you now could use, you could use uh, Vercel to host it. Oh, that's that's exactly my plan. Believe it or not, actually, I think the front end the front end's on Netlify, so I might try to do something super terrifying and run like a back end in Vercel and the front end on Netlify just to just to spread spread the love around. Um, <laughs> Good. But yeah, aside from that, I'll just be here making coffee, doing work, getting stuff done, and uh, roaming roaming the streets of Northeast Minneapolis to get some sunlight. Yep, for sure. Well, uh, if you're looking for the show notes of this fine episode, you can uh, go to thenexus.tv slash pk57 to find those. Uh, if you want to chat about the episode, you can go to reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Look at that, we got our own sub- subreddit. Uh, and if you like what you're doing here, you can support the network uh, on Patreon uh, at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. That's our show. So uh, it might be time to close it out with the customary have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.